Hey, thanks everyone. So I'm uh, Will Hertling, and I'm going to be talking about formatting for print with Ruby, HTML, CSS, and print XML. So I work for HP. And unlike everyone else who just goes, we're hiring. Well, we might be hiring. <laughs> um, but only for people who are recent college graduates. I don't make those sort of rules, but if, we want, if, we kn if you know anyone who's a recent college graduate, send them my way. We'd love to talk to them. So I am, um, that was one I thought I was going to show. All right, so I'm going to talk today a little bit about the context. What's the business problem I'm trying to solve? I'm going to talk about some issues that are unique to print, then discuss the different approaches that I took to the problem, um, and then I'll show what solution I actually ended up doing. Um, I passed out some handouts. So there should be a book on each of your tables. So that's actually the end product. It's a copy of Avogadro Corp, a black book. Um, so pass that around. There's like five in the room. Uh, and then there's some big 11 by 17 handouts that look like this. And there's a funny story behind this handout because I asked on the mailing list a couple of months ago, uh, how big should the present font be? And someone said 32 point. The screens at New Relic are so small we can't see them. So I was like, I can't do anything with 32 points. So I made this handout. And then, of course, I come here and we've got big monitors and lots of them. So it was a lie. Um, so when I'm not writing code for HP, I'm a science fiction writer, and I've got three books about artificial intelligence. Um, if that's your thing, I hope you'll check them out. Um, so normally, uh, when I write a book, I have a manuscript. It's like 80,000 words, and when it's done, it's got to get converted into ebooks and print books. So the ebook workflow looks like this. I have a writing tool called Scrivener, um, and I basically say, hey, export to EPUB. And boom, I have an EPUB, and it's ready to publish. Uh, and the first time I set that up, that might take like an hour or so to get everything exactly the way I want. But any time I want to repeat that process, if someone says, you've got a bug, third word of chapter three has got a problem in it, I can fix it and you know, re-release the ebook in a matter of minutes. This is what the workflow looks like for a print book. <laughs> um, there's lots of manual steps, right? I export to Microsoft Word. I send that to my designer. My designer imports it into InDesign by hand. They lay it all out. They send me back a PDF, which always has errors in it. I have to proof that. I have to communicate it with things like on page 136, chapter 3, line 4, word 2. There's a typo. And we go back and forth lots of times. Um, and they're all manual steps. And so every set of corrections just generates yet more errors that require yet more corrections. So, you know, a typically one of my ebooks will get updated, you know, a dozen times for as an issue as small as one typo. Whereas the print book, I batch up all of the fixes, I update it one time, and then that's it. After that, if there's more fixes, it's just not worth the pain. Basically, deploying to production is too hard. Um, so <laughs> what I wanted was a fully automated process with no human intervention. I wanted it to be repeatable, and I wanted it to be fast. So that's all well and good, but print design has a whole bunch of requirements that are a little tricky. right? And this is sort of the laundry list. As I was looking at different solutions, besides could I code that, I had to say, did it support all of these things? So I'll go through just a few of them. right? This is a typical sort of book layout, right? and it's got everything from alternating headers on the left and right side. This is the same thing that's on this handout, so you can look at that if that's better. To um, um, alternating in, inner, inside and outside margins, those are different. Um, there's uh, things that you have to do with drop caps and chapter titles and where the page breaks happen. Um, so all sorts of stuff dealing with print that we don't think about when we're rendering stuff for the screen, which is what I do all day long. Um, here's another example of something that not a lot of tools can do. So in this case, we have a chapter that starts on the right. What's unique is that the left page doesn't have any content. If the left page doesn't have any content, it, good print design would say it shouldn't get a header or footer. And um, that also excluded some of the tools that I could work with. That's what you do so that none of the pages are blank, right? <laughs> this is 
Um, <laughs> and then um, here's another example of things to, you know, that I had to think about that I never really thought about before, which was the left and right must align so that the front and back are aligned. Otherwise, you get weird things, right? We're all familiar with it. You're looking at a printed page, and you can see it on this, right? It's like what's on the back bleeds through to what's on the front. And that actually causes fatigue. It causes eye fatigue when you're reading a book all the time. And so a good print book is going to have the fronts and the backs aligned so that the lines are at exactly the same spot. Um, the text, like a, this is a single paragraph of text. Um, it is generally full justified. Justification only looks good if you have hyphenation. Um, because otherwise you end up with these awkward spaces in between words. Um, hyphenation only looks good if there's limits put on it so that it doesn't hyphenate every single word in a paragraph. Um, so you end up having to not only need support for justification and hyphenation, but then limit how much hyphenation is done. So lots of things that we don't think about if we're doing web design, which is what I do all the time. So here's some of the approaches that I rejected. So prawn was the first thing I went with because many years ago I needed to generate PDFs and I used prawn. Um, and it works great for some things, but it's basically a very low level library. And I wasn't interested in writing my own rendering engine, right? I just basically wanted to spew stuff out, not think about putting strokes on pages. So I threw that out. Um, I con considered LaTeX. Um, LaTeX is actually pretty good. There's a lot of books that have been done with LaTeX. And they're great if you want your book to look like your grad school research paper. And if you want it to look like anything else, you're screwed or you have a steep learning curve ahead of you to basically override everything LaTeX wants to do. Um, and frankly, the syntax makes my head hurt, so I ruled it out mostly on that. The other things are justifications. I just didn't want to have to do much of it. So HTML to PDF felt like the ideal, right? This uses a set of skills that I do all day long in my day job. I know how to style stuff with CSS. But the renderer has to support a long list of capabilities. And the first thing I considered was WK HTML to PDF. It's free. It's HTML to C plus CSS to PDF. Perfect. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, it's basically a command line library that will render HTML and CSS to PDF, or you can integrate it into Ruby and Rails in lots of different ways. But it turns out to not support everything I needed. It doesn't support putting different headers and footers in different sections of the document. It doesn't support robust hyphenation. It doesn't have widow and orphan control. Um, and it turns out to kind of be a pain in the ass. And if you go look on Stack Overflow at WK HTML to PDF, all the questions are about, how do I get this thing installed? How do I get it with the right patched version of WebKit and all this other stuff? Um, so I could never get hyphenation working, even though, in theory, if I had the right version with the right patched version of WebKit, I could have done it. I couldn't make it happen. Um, but I still think it's the right solution if you don't need the level of sophistication of a print book, if you're trying to make something else for print. Um, what finally led me down a certain path was seeing this chart, which was the chart uh, uh, in Wikipedia of CSS3 support for media boxes. So media boxes are basically all of the regions around the page, what goes on the top, left, right, and bottom. And the only thing that supports them, they're part of the standard, but the only thing that supports them is a tool called Prince XML. So it's a closed source HTML plus CSS to PDF tool command line. It's very fast. Um, it generates that book in under two seconds, which is kind of mind-blowing. It's a 300-page PDF, and it can make that in th two seconds. And it supports everything that I needed. Um, but the one downside is it's incredibly expensive. It's $500 for a personal use license or $4,000 for a server's license, um, which can be pretty hard to stomach. The, uh, the other thing that sort of made the case for me was this sample that was on the Prince XML website. So this is what you would get if you did file print on Wikipedia. You get something that looks like this, which is perfectly acceptable and usable, just ugly. Um, over here, they wrote some custom CSS for printing Wikipedia. And it looks beautiful. It looks like an encyclopedia. If you're old enough to remember a print encyclopedia, like there's hundreds of years of design that went into what should an encyclopedia look like. Uh, and this conforms to that. And seeing this, to me, said Prince XML was the right tool. So 
I sort of went with that. Um, so I'll talk now a little bit about what I did. So the raw process was this. Scrivener had a way to export raw XML. It's very flat XML um, with no structure in it at all. It had only HR tags and P tags. Um, and from that, I had to create something structured. Um, I also needed to throw away all of the built-in styles. I can't even tell you what they were doing, but they were generating like dozens or hundreds of styles. Um, throw all that stuff away. Use lots and lots of Nokogiri to turn the flat HTML into something structured. Um, and then finally make a command line call to Prince XML to provide the intermediate HTML I generated plus the CSS. I always love this quote, not that I'm for violence, but I love this quote, XML is like violence. If it doesn't solve your problems, you're not using enough of it. And what I learned on this project is no go Geary is like violence too. <laughs> um, so I make a lot of passes through the HTML structure to get it into the final format. Um, all right, at this point in time, I'm going to switch to the handout just because we're sort of there. Let me see if I can pull that up. Yeah. Um, it's, it's sort of worse than that. Yeah, you no, know, it's sort of the worst of all worlds. Um, they provide a bunch of styling. Um, but they're not actually styles. They're just basically like laying down stuff on top of what's there so that um, you said you wanted a heading and you actually get a mishmash of whatever other styles were previously applied. Uh, it's sort of the worst of all worlds. So I kind of just try to avoid it or do the minimum to get uh, that. Anyhow, let me, does everyone have a handout? Should I go on there or should I try to stick it up on screen? I'll just go around this. So let's just go clockwise with um, the chapters. This is going to come out so good on the video recording. <laughs> so, um, so starting clockwise with chapters. So I've broken everything by this point in time. I took my flat HTML. Um, and, and there's an example of some of the code uh, in the headers and footers box that says self.sectionalize. That's the sort of thing. I know it's super tiny, but that's the sort of thing that uh, I'm doing to break the structure of the document I'm going through. I'm looking for um, my chapter titles to sort of figure out where are my chapters, where are my sections, and I'm providing that kind of structure. So when I find something with a class of chapter, I know that I'm going to put a page break before it. Um, that's sort of a most basic thing, right? And that's when you start doing print CSS, you start doing a lot of things with page breaks and stuff like that that you wouldn't do if you're doing CSS for screen design. Um, the next thing down is the drop cap. That was really interesting. Yeah. No, that's that's standard CSS. Um, drop caps, there um, that big capital letter that starts off the paragraph, and you'll notice that this paragraph is interesting because it starts first with a quote and then a le letter M. And if you don't care how the quote gets formatted is really easy. All you have to do is use a first child and first letter selector um, in CSS, and you're done. It's pure CSS. There's nothing you have to do with the HTML. The problem is that first letter will select both the quote and the capital letter M, which is not really what you want, because each of those things needs to be styled separately. So that was some more no-go Geary to turn it into the structure that you see right underneath that, which is um, a paragraph that's got a class of first paragraph, um, and then a span specifically for the opening quote, and then a span specifically for the letter M. Um, and then those things get styled. And one thing that I think that's interesting here is, you know, design people talk a lot about letter kerning. Um, and so I put down a class for what letter it was that was going into that span, because I knew that uh, where a letter M was would be different than the amount of space a letter I might need or a letter O might need. I ended up not using that, but it was there if I needed it. Um, working the way down the page to body text. So some interesting things there, right? I've got the text align justify, um, which basically all renderers are going to support. Hyphenation, which some renderers support. The hyphenation control is specific to Prince XML, so Prince hyphenate lines. 
I'm controlling the maximum number of lines in a row to hyphenate, which is two. How many letters can be on the top line and on the bottom line, three and two. So those are just sort of good, uh, good sort of norms, print norms, I would say. The other interesting things to note are the units. So the font size and line height are in points, not pixels. So if you're doing any kind of print stuff, you're going to be doing points. Points are a 72nd of an inch if you've never done print design. They're almost a pixel. Um, the orphans and widows, is that like a minimum? Like minimum allowed? Yeah, so that's the minimum number, right? So that's basically, you could go larger, but there would be no reason to. Um, the other thing that's interesting about print design is that line height is set to be a good amount larger than the font. That's pretty normal. That helps your eye track across a relatively wide page. And in fact, the wider your page is, generally the bigger the spacing between the lines to help you track. Um, so anytime you're doing print design, you're going to be setting a line height relative to the width of the page. Uh, continuing around the headers and footers. So one of the things that I hadn't ever encountered before, I learned later, it is part of CSS, is this notion of basically naming pages. So um, if you look in the second black box under headers and footers, there's this div book main. And underneath that, you have a page is set to book main. What that's basically saying is, I'm going to have some CSS later targeting only the pages for the main part of the book. So I want to target everything from the prologue through the chapters, but not any of the front matter. Uh, and then um, you also see I'm setting my page number to one there. So basically, page one in a book is not the first page of a book. Page one in a book is the first page of the first chapter. Uh, the down below that, you see some of the other page selectors for um, page, book, main, left. So there, I'm able to target the margin boxes for the top and the bottom left for the left-hand page. And then I've got separate CSS for targeting the right-hand page, more CSS for targeting a blank page. So you've got left, right, and blank are your CSS selectors. Um, only Prince XML seems to support all of this. WK HTML to PDF has support for doing headers and footers, but it's basically just a mishmash of some HTML and JavaScript that you can execute, and it doesn't seem to respect margin boxes or any other way that you would think of doing headers and footers. Uh, and then the last thing continuing up clockwise is this page setup. So obviously, you're going to set the physical size of the page. Um, because a book is bound in the middle, you're not going to use a left margin and a right margin. You're going to use an inside margin and an outside margin, um, which obviously takes into account which pages are odd and even. And, and that margin inside and outside is only supported by Prince XML again. So let's see. All right. So if we flip it over onto the back, you'll actually see an example of a bug that has made it into the book. So uh, on this case, we're looking at the upper left-hand corner, uh, which is the section with a blue line and a red line. And it's showing the alignment. So the blue line is showing that the pages, that the lines are aligned <laughs> uh, at the top of the page. But, but when we get to the bottom of the page, the lines are no longer aligned. And why is that? Um, that's because there's a little section of email that's formatted there. And I screwed up. The CSS for the email has a margin top of 12 point. Well, if you remember before, the line height was set to 16 point. The only way that I'm going to have all of my lines remain aligned all throughout the book is if everything is a multiple of 16 point. Um, so having the 12 point there threw off my alignment. And that's one of the things you have to be aware of. Uh, and then one last thing, I guess, about the book was that you'll see also in that same example, the left page is two lines longer than the right page. And um, that is something that I was surprised to learn that designers actually fix up by hand. So a designer would take a 300-page book, and they would ensure that all of the pages had the same number of lines. Um, and they would do that by hand. And so then if you give them a correction, that causes anything to reflow, they're going to go through the entire book and even all of the pages by hand again, which is why it turns out I would have things like a paragraph would disappear in a section of the book unrelated to where I was making changes. I'm like, how did that get screwed up? 
Well, the answer was they were going through and making line breaks by hand um, and page breaks by hand. So um, a little surprising. My solution, Prince XML doesn't have any sort of automatic page evening control, even though in theory you could do it. Um, I decided to just live with uneven pages. <laughs> Uh, so the last example is um, I was sort of uh, so interested in what they had done for Wikipedia, I decided with my buddy Mike um, that we would try to do the same thing for Wired one day. Uh, because if we, w we went to Wired, we did file print, and we got uh, 22 pages, of which only one and a half pages was the article, and the other two was sort of useless nav stuff, right? So it turns out that Prince XML does this phenomenal job. So you can see the top uh, wired example is what you get with file print. I'm not showing you the first 21 pages. I'm just showing you when you actually get to the content, which is OK, but, but still ugly. And the second version down below is what we created. Uh, and the tip there, if you want to do this, if you want to create CSS for print pages, is basically display none on everything that's irrelevant. Um, format your body text for print which basically consists of the justification, hyphenation, and line spacing are the key things. Um, making the images a reasonable size, we went with a two-column layout, in which case if you make an image full width of the column, you're pretty much OK. But if you're going with a one-column layout, you want your images to be much smaller and usually float them to the right. Um, and then two columns just makes printed stuff look better. So um, that's about it. So, any questions? <laughs> yeah, so I went with hexadecimal page numbering. Um, it was one of those things that, like, my books appeal to geeks, and I was catering to those people. I figured it would annoy some people, but if the tool provided, actually, I will say, the desire to do hexadecimal page numbering was actually what inspired everything else. There was no way to do it in InDesign, um, and I really wanted it, and I tried to figure out if I could just crack open the PDFs and, and change all of the page numbers, but it actually, in the end, was just easier. Did you ask that on the list? Uh, I did ask that on the list a long time ago. Um, uh, about the hexadecimal page numbers? Um, I had one person say that they hated it, uh, and I haven't really heard that much comment otherwise. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so for the, you, you said the syntax of low text was really like messing with your mind. Do you know the M4 macro address for that? Do, no. Do you know what M4 macros are? Uh -uh. So the, what, right. So what you do <laughs> is you <laughs> you write to get no no you write out you write out so you write out what you don't like about the low text and you write some M4 macros to fix. <laughs> and after about an hour, you think, well, you know, really, I can live with that. <laughs> that one. And within a fairly short time, the latex stuff looks pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All what you compare it to, yeah. Uh, uh. You know, does, does Prince XML also have, is there an XSLP to get into EPUB portal for that? No, there isn't. And if I was going to do the project over, um, which I'm thinking about doing because it would actually be a useful service for a lot of authors. I mean, authors are going out and paying designers 400 bucks to 1,000 bucks to create this for them, to create that manual workflow that I hated so much. Yeah. Um, what I would probably do is I would probably go from EPUB to, to a print book because EPUB is fairly normalized and it's already got a lot of the structure. Oh, right, yeah. So. Um, I did consider Pandoc. Um, so my friend Gene Kim, uh, who wrote um, The Phoenix Project, um, is actually trying to generate his next book with Pandoc. But I feel like he has embedded in there somewhere LaTeX. And that was enough that I was like, uh-uh, <laughs> you do that. And you know, the, my book's out and his book isn't. So <laughs> I think that was a wise choice. Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah. Newt was dealing with exactly the same problem where they told him he couldn't change. He could make changes as long as it didn't change the flow. <laughs> right. And he said that's absurd. So he went off and wrote a typeset program. 
yes. And yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I knew that, right? I mean, uh, he had created this tool specifically to solve this problem, but I think, you know, technology moves on, and if I could solve it in a, something I was more comfortable with, that's the way I wanted to go. But yes, I was very much aware of it, and it seemed, you know, sacrilegious to not be using tech for what it was designed for. Uh, I just find that... I don't know. I got used to Scrivener a long time ago. I mean, I've written five books in it, so at a certain point in time, it's just like it's where my mind goes. Um, you know, it, it lets me jump around in a way that works for me. So, cool. Um, so, if you check out Prince XML, they have a lot of really cool samples up. I think it's a cool tool. I'm sorry that it's so expensive because I think it would be really widely used if it wasn't quite so expensive. Um, and check out my books if you want. Cool. Thank you, guys.